And also pay attention to the water quality because uh, water quality matters. And <laughs> I'm going to show you here. Here's a here's a, a well piped boiler done by a friend of mine, and it's all insulated with a nice drop header. And this Smith boiler has a skim tapping, and the skim tapping's right here on the side. It's it's very difficult to skim through the top of a boiler because the oil that's in the that's in the boiler when you buy it is going to cling to the metal. Uh, there's oil inside of a, of a new steam boiler because they have to machine the boiler. And, and to do that, they have to pour oil all over the tools when they're, when they're drilling and, and tapping the connections. And they don't take that oil out of the boiler. So you, you got to skim it when you start it up. And there's instructions in the installation operating manual that show you how to do that. And we want to skim it from the side. And the Smith's kind enough to give us this big skim tapping. And the reason why you see a T here is because my buddy who did this job knows that if he uses a T, he can fire the boiler for a day or two and then shut off the burner and just let cold water trickle in and he could pull the uh, pull the plug out of that T and see where the water level is. Because without that T, you really can't tell where the water level is here and you're liable to be skimming from where the oil ain't. So he skims into a T and it goes into a bucket and, and this takes at least a full day to do this properly. And he keeps checking the quality of the water as he's, as he's skimming it. And you, you could check the quality of the water by by having a, a test pipe. And that would be, a, say, a 12-inch nipple, 2-inch diameter, and clean it up real good with soapy water so that there's no oil in that test pipe. Put a cap on the bottom of it. And when you're skimming for oil, just take a sample of it every so often and bring the water to a boil with, with your torch and look down the pipe and see what you got. And if, it, if, it, if it's making foamy bubbles or if, it's, or if it's surging like crazy, then you know there's still oil in the water. So you got to get that oil out of there. If you go on heatinghelp.com and you look in the, uh, in, the, in the systems help section, just search uh, Jerry Gill. And Jerry Gill is a, is a great contractor. I'll tell you more about him later when we talk about venting. But Jerry Gill goes into every steam boiler and he flushes it out with this special tool that he made that's just a copper pipe attached to a hose and it's got an elbow on the end. And Jerry will go into the, the steam port and he will stick that copper tube back and he'll wash the boiler. And the, and the stuff that comes out of that brand new boiler is not to be believed. It's just this black, murky water that's there from the installation of the boiler, the piping that you're doing, and also from the boiler itself, just from the manufacturing process. So watch that video and you'll be convinced that you've got to clean a boiler properly before you commission it. Over here, this on the side, this is the skim tapping for this side outlet boiler here. And I like the uh, people use our, uh, our stickers over here to scare the customers. And this is the drop header that goes up over here to rise it's going up to the header and the pipe continues down the back we looked at this from the other side before and over here they are they they built a makeshift funnel and they're going to clean the system on startup and the classic cleaner in the old days was trisodium phosphate which is a very strong soap it won't damage anything that's in a boiler it won't damage rubber push nipples it's good but in many areas where where it's uh, there's a concern about phosphates getting into the aquifer it's not allowed so instead we use a, a chemical soap that you could buy in any hardware store it's called mex it's very inexpensive you only need one pound for every 50 gallons of water that's in the boiler so you don't need much of it you mix it up in a bucket of hot water and uh, my guy here uses this funnel that he made to pour the stuff in and he closed the valve and then he just lets it run through the entire system and he catches it on the return with that return line shut off valve and the drain and he gets rid of all that crap that's in the old system before it has a chance to get into the new boiler. So MEX is a good way to do it. Also while you're at it, if you're having a problem and you're troubleshooting, check the pH on the boiler because the pH is uh, should be somewhere between seven and nine. That's ideal for a steam boiler. Normal pH is, is seven, and that would be like milk. Uh, pH goes up on the alkaline side and down on the acid side. So if we consider something like Drano, which eats things, you you know, some people think Drano is an acid, but it's not. Drano is, is a very, very alkaline, very, very high pH substance. And the reason why we use high alkaline with with drain cleaners is because once you get over a pH of, of 10, it's impossible to corrode metal pipe. So that's why they say Drano is safe for pipes because it's got a pH of about 14, but it'll eat, it'll eat anything that's in the pipe. So when we're making steam with, with water, we take feed water in off the street and the feed water is gonna contain carbonates, which is basically dead stuff, dead plant and animal life, 
and the carbonate just breaks down when you when you boil the water and, and forms a, a carbon dioxide, which goes off with the steam and then mixes with the condensate on the return side and forms carbonic acid. So the tendency of a steam boiler is to move toward the corrosive side for the pH to move this way, because carbonic acid is what you'd find in, in say, Coca-Cola. And that'll eat through metal. So uh, we try to keep the pH between seven and nine. So back in the day, the old timers used to use uh, two things. They used vinegar and they used baking soda. And some people think that they use this, these two things to clean the system. Well, that's kind of crazy because, I mean, try washing your hands with vinegar and see if they get clean or wash your hands with baking soda. Now, these things were used to adjust the pH. So if the pH moved toward the corrosive side, which it normally would when the carbon dioxide built up from the carbonites, uh, uh, from the, uh, the, the carbon breaking down, uh, we would try to balance it back toward neutral by using baking soda, which is a base. So it would push it this way. And if we use too much baking soda, we might get up to 10, which is okay. And that's a little high, but that's, you know, you can't get any corrosion there. But a little bit more baking soda, now we're going to get to a pH of 11. And at 11, you'll start to see this phenomenon called foaming. So there's, there's surging, which is caused typically by oil or, or dirt in the water. And, and then there's foaming, which is caused by the pH being wrong. And foaming is, is water bubbles that don't break. So you got this surface of the water that forms these really tough bubbles. And it's very, very difficult to push steam through that, through that bubble brigade that's up there on the top. If you want to see this in real life, go to any place where there's a hot tub, whether it's in a health club or in a hotel. And watch what happens when they turn on the jets on that hot tub. You're going to see this foam form all over the top, and the bubbles don't break. So you'll see kids will go in there and pick up the bubbles, and they'll put it on their heads, and they'll make little hats out of the bubbles. And I always smile at that because, because what they're doing is, is they're sitting in, in water that's maintained at a, at a pretty alkaline level. And the reason why the people maintaining the hot tub do that is because the people sitting in the hot tub often don't get out of the hot tub when they need to urinate. So they're adding acid to the water in the form of ureic acid. So the baking soda or whatever it is that they use to increase the pH in the hot tub is there to counteract the pee that's in the water. So I know it's disgusting, but it's a lesson in chemistry for you. So if the pH gets too high where the boiler is foaming, they would often use a mild acid like vinegar, which pushes the pH this way and stops the foaming. So vinegar stops foaming, baking soda stops corrosion. So there you have it. That's why they use that's why they use these uh, these chemicals. And uh, if you're troubleshooting, one of the great things to use is litmus paper. Uh, litmus paper. You can pick this up at, at most drugstores. Just blow down the low water cutoff and check either with litmus paper or you could use uh, a pool test kit to see what you got. A uh, pool test chemicals will also work in a boiler pH increase, pH decrease. And it's just a, it's a neat way to check that because uh, sometimes people add things to steam boilers that cause a problem. I, uh, we're going to take a break in a minute, but I want to tell you a story before we stop about uh, getting called to consult once many years ago on a, on a job in a very, very fancy apartment building where they had this odor coming out of the radiators that had just started up. And uh, the, the odor was uh, unmistakably urine. And, uh, you know, you walk into the apartment and it just, it just smelled like... Uh, uh, wet diapers everywhere. So I uh, I went downstairs and I and I met with the superintendent who lived in the basement with his family and uh, and I chatted with him a bit and I said man it must be great work in here. And he says oh it's okay and I said boy I, I'll bet you get these great tips at, at Christmas time you know people must treat you really well and he said yeah you would think so he says but they're a bunch of cheapskates he says that's why they're rich he says the poor people will give you a tip the rich people never give you anything so I said ah what can you do and he says what can you do he says, come here, I'll show you what you could do. And, and this guy takes me into the boiler room, and he, and he had this, this big empty can, like, like you'd buy at uh, Price Club, you know, <laughs> empty can, like a, like a big Maxwell House coffee can. And all day long, he was saving his urine in the can. And, and before he went off at night, when they turned the heat on for the people upstairs, and it was all one pipe steam through the whole building, he, uh, he, he unscrewed the uh, relief valve and, and he had a funnel and he poured the urine into the into the boiler and he put the relief valve back on and he sent it up to the people and he said to me that's what you can do so uh, so I, I recommended that he stop doing that <laughs> if he wanted to stay out of trouble so it's a it's a strike one for the little guy there it's, it was 
good win for him. But it's also a cautionary tale if you're adding any kind of chemical to a steam boiler, particularly if it's one pipe steam, because anything you put in that boiler, I guarantee you that that smell is going to come out in the apartments or in the house where those one pipe steam radiators are. And these days with people being so concerned about carcinogens and being concerned about health issues, if you do work on a boiler and you put chemicals in there and that chemical smell comes out upstairs, it's going to be an issue for you. The same thing goes for painting radiators. If you're going to paint a steam radiator, be sure you're using something that doesn't have any any uh, VOCs, you know, vo vo what is it? volatile organic compounds, the smell of the of the uh, the paint or whatever it is coming out in the room because people will be very upset with you.